Okay, so thank you for the introduction. So this morning I'm going to talk about diet, microbiota and metabolic health. But firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge my supervisors, Dr. Ginny Willis, Professor Richard Geary, Professor Gerald Tannock and Dr. Paula Skidmore. So we've heard a lot about the microbiota yesterday, so hopefully this morning I'm going to provide you with a bit more of a background about the microbiota and the research that we're carrying out. So what is the human microbiota? So it's widely accepted that we're colonised by many microbes during and immediately after birth. But until recently, it was thought that the placenta barrier kept infants sterile in the womb, and it was thought that the baby was first exposed to microorganisms during birth. However, recent research suggests that infants do incorporate an initial microbiome by bacteria tr transmission through the placenta barrier. But little is known about the number and identity of these microbes. So what colonizes us after birth? So it's mostly bacteria, so around 90% bacteria, but also archaea, fungi, protozoa, and viruses. After birth, the microorganisms go everywhere we're exposed to the external world. The community of organisms is known as the human microbiota, and this includes skin, airways, vagina, mouth, and gastrointestinal tract. So here's an example of this being an ever-changing field. It was thought that only 10% of our cells are human, with microbes accounting for the remaining 90%. But just yesterday I saw a new paper that was published which was contesting this, saying that the ratio was more like one to one. And this was the, when they accounted for red blood cells. This doesn't change the um, greater genetic potential for the microbiota though. <coughs> So looking at the genetic potential, the microbiome is in the order of millions of genes compared to the human genome, which is in the order of around 20 to 25,000 genes. So the microbiota is hugely complex. The microbiome is modifiable through ge genetic and environmental um, circumstances, including method of birth, breastfeeding, antibiotics, diet, exposure to toxigen, toxins and pathogens, and hygiene. Inter-individual variation among human genes is only about 0.5%, compared to the variation among microbial genes, which is substantial. So I'm going to focus on the gut microbiota, as this is what I'm interested in for my PhD. The gut microbiota is considered one of the most densely populated ecosystems in nature. In comparison the, to the colon, there are only small numbers of bacteria present in the stomach and small intestine, and this is due to acid, bile, and pancreatic secretion, which kills most ingested microorganisms. The large intestine is a nutrient-rich environment and has up to 100 trillion microbes present. So classification, the hierarchy of biological classification has eight major taxonomic ranks. Most gut bacteria fall into one of five phyla, and these phyla are further divided into increasingly specific categories until we eventually reach the level of bacterial species. More than 90% of the species belong to the phyla Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes. So where did the microbes come from during and after birth? Initially, there's several different factors that are important in determining the bacterial population. For example, vaginal birth babies are exposed to their mother's vaginal and fecal microbes with a mixture of a few of her skin-dwelling microbes, compared to babies born by caesarean who are first colonised by more of the mother's skin-dwelling microbes. Following this is often their father's microbial communities um, and the surrounding environment, so the equipment, the nursing staff and the air. Feeding has a next impact on colonisation, so breast milk provides a secondary route of maternal microbial transmission compared to formula-fed babies. And the foods introduced when weaning the baby will also have an impact on the composition of the microbiota. 
Different host genes will also impact the composition of the microbi microbiota, and the bacteria themselves will also have an impact. So, for example, which receptors they have will determine, determine if they can survive in particular environments. The intestinal pH is also very important, and literature also suggests that the immune system plays a role. So poor nutrition, unnecessary use of antibiotics, excessive cleanliness, or too much exposure to bad bacteria can also feature among factors which are less than ideal for starting populations in the gut. It's thought to take about three years for our microbiota to develop to the right level and to stabilise. The microbiota of an adult is fairly stable and is maintained by competition and resilience. So the main functions of the gut flora are metabolic, trophic and protective. So the large intestine or the colon is a fermenter which extracts nutrients and energy from our diets. So the non-digestible components of foods, such as resistant starches and celluloses, are fermented by the bacteria which are present in our colon. So the principal end products of carbohydrate fermentation are short-chain fatty acids, such as acetate and butyrate, as well as gases, such as carbon dioxide. Short-chain fatty acids are absorbed in the colon and are used for a variety of different purposes. So, for example, the short-chain fatty acids, such as acetate and propionate, can be utilised in the liver as substrates for the production of glucose and lipids. Butyrate is an important energy source for colonic epithelial cells, and acetate can also go through the bloodstream to the muscles directly as a source of energy. The types and the amounts of short-chain fatty acids produced are determined by how much of non-digestible carbohydrate is consumed and the composition of the gut bacteria. <coughs> colonic bacteria also play a role in the production of vitamins, so such as vitamin K, and the absorption of iron, such as magnesium and iron. The bacteria also have a trophic role as they're involved in epithelial cell growth and di differentiation. And this is important for the immune system. Our bacteria also protect us from pathogens, which is another important role. So how do we study the gut microbiota? Researchers have been interested in the gut microbiota since the 1900s. However, culture-based methods had limitations. For example, bacteria are anaerobic, so don't like being exposed to air. So around 70% of the bacteria wouldn't survive petri. So we were only seeing a fraction of the gut microbiota. But around 20 years ago, um, high throughput sequencing technologies were developed, and that doesn't involve a culture, making it possible to identify entire microbiomes. So without going into detail, to study the microbiota, we collect a faecal sample, and we extract the DNA from the bacteria, and then we amplify it using PCR. The DNA sequences are then analysed using bioinformatic methods. The microbiome can be characterised in a number of ways, including the composition, so what species are present, the diversity, so the number of ticks are represented, and the abundance, so the total microbial content. So why are we interested in the microbiome? Research suggests that disruptions in the normal balance between the gut microbiome and the host, known as a dysbiosis, leads to disease, diseases such as diabetes, obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, allergic diseases such as asthma and food allergies, and mental health, so mood and depression. And diabetes is the area that I'm working in and also doing my research in. So there's a lot of research that's been carried out over the past few years, and initially this was carried out in mice, or germ-free mice in particular, um, but there are some human trials which have been completed more recently. Studies have reported a gut dysbiosis, so an alter in the gut microbial composition in people with diabetes or obesity, but however, however there have been inconsistencies in findings. 
So some of the trends and proposed mechanisms include a link to diabetes due to the increase in energy harvest, which could be leading to weight gain and therefore insulin resistance. It has been suggested that there is a decrease in the butyrate-producing bacteria in those with type 2 diabetes. Some researchers have suggested that a low bacterial richness is related to obesity and diabetes. And other researchers have suggested that the microbiota contributes to low-level inflammation in the onset of type 2 diabetes. It is thought that these inconsistencies and in findings to date could be explained by limitations in methodologies. It's also very difficult going from animal models to human trials where the environment can no longer be tightly controlled. So for example, there's been small study populations and heterogeneous populations used. There's also been a variety of methods used for characterising and reporting the gut microbiota, which makes comparisons be between studies extremely difficult. There has been incomplete data on diabetes medications, and participants have also been taking a variety of different diabetes medications. There's also been limited data on dietary intake, and there's been limited data on physical activity reported. So this just provides you with an example from one study, and this shows the various different types of diabetes medications that participants were on in this study. So we know there is some research suggesting that there might be a link between the gut microbiota and glucose tolerance or diabetes. So what is diabetes and how big is, in, is the problem in New Zealand and worldwide? So there are three main types of diabetes, type 1, type 2 and gestational diabetes. Over, over time, high blood glucose levels can damage the heart, blood vessels, eyes, kidneys and nerves. The complications of diabetes lead to decreased quality of life, excess morbidity and mortality, and increased health care costs. So di type 2 diabetes is the most common form of diabetes, and this is what I'm focusing on for my research. In type 2 diabetes, either the body doesn't produce enough insulin, or the cells in the body don't recognise the insulin that's present, and the end result is high glucose levels in your blood. There's a clear link between being overweight or obese, high blood pressure, and or disordered levels of fat in the blood. And the combination of this is sometimes called the metabolic syndrome. So as I'll previously mentioned by Professor Seidel, diabetes is a growing problem. Around one in 11 adults worldwide um, have diabetes. It's a global emergency. There are 153 million people in the Western Pacific with diabetes. Looking more specifically at New Zealand, in New Zealand, 32.5% of the population has pre or type 2 diabetes. And by the age of 65, 60% of the population has pre or type 2 diabetes. And New Zealand has an ageing population. So how would you know if you had pre or type 2 diabetes? So in New Zealand we screen for people in diabetes in conjunction with a cardiovascular risk assessment using the criteria shown in this table. Screening is particularly important as people with diabetes can be asymptomatic. It also helps us to identify those with pre-diabetes who can make changes to their diet and lifestyle to help them from preventing type 2 diabetes. So the diagnostic criteria in New Zealand is shown in this table. So in New Zealand we now use a test for glycated haemoglobin for the diagnosis of pre and type 2 diabetes. And we consider, it, consider a level of 50 millimole per mole or above as diagnostic of diabetes and a level of 41 to 49 millimole per mole indicates pre-diabetes. So this leads me to the first part of my research so we're completing a cross-sectional exploratory study to investigate the hypothesis that differences in gut ecology exist between individuals with normal glucose tolerance, pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. This is a novel area with limited research on type 2 diabetes in the gut microbiota in humans. 
In this study, I aim to eliminate a large number of confounding variables in previous research. I also want to look specifically at the New Zealand population. And furthermore, I'm including a pre-diabetes group as I'd like to look at the spectrum of glycemic control, not just the extremes. So my study includes adults with normal glucose tolerance, pre-diabetes, and those with type 2 diabetes only taking metformin as their diabetes medication. I've aimed to match for BMI and age. Exclusion criteria includes antibiotic use within a month and a medical history of significant GI disease, so celiac or IBD. We've collected a large amount of data, including demographics, so age, gender, ethnicity and education. We've looked at anthropometric measurements, so BMI, waist and hip um, circumference. Everyone's completed a four-day weighed food diary, um, and this includes three weekdays and one weekend day. And from this we can look at amounts of macro and micronutrients in selected food and food groups, such as fruit and vegetables. Um, fasting blood um, samples have been analysed for fasting glucose and HbA1c as measures for glucose control, and hormones affecting metabolism, including insulin, leptin and ghrelin. We're also looking at lipid parameters, including cholesterol and triglycerides, and high sensitivity CRP protein was also measured as a marker of inflammation. So faecal samples have been collected um, to look at the gut microbial population, which will be characterised through high-throughput DNA sequencing. This will allow us to make comparisons and detection of differences between the study groups. Urine samples have also been collected, and metabolites will be characterised using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So what we are expecting to see is a difference in the gut flora between, um, across the glycemic spectrum. The next question is, can early interventions to alter the microbiome um, prevent diabetes or reduce the complications of diabetes? <coughs> so research has already shown that di diet can have a profound influence on the composition of the gut microbiota. So these researchers compared the faecal um, microbiota of 15 healthy European children who have a modern Western diet, which is high in animal protein, sugar, starch, and fat, and low in fibre. And they compared this to 14 healthy children from a rural African village of Burkina Faso, where the diet is similar to that of early human settlement. The Burkina Faso diet is low in fat and animal protein, and rich in starch, fibre and plant polysaccharides, and so is predominantly vegetarian. The researchers found significant differences in the gut microbiota between the two groups. The Burkina Faso ch children showed a significant enrich enrichment in bacteroidetes and a depletion in the firmicutes. They also had an abundance of bacteria known to contain a set of genes for cellulose and xylem hydrolysis, which was completely lacking in the European children. In addition, they found significantly more short-chain fatty acids in the Burkina Faso children compared to the European children. So this, this leads me to the, my point that there is concern that we've lost microbial diversity due to the following factors. So there's widespread antimicrobial use. We use chlorinated water. There's an option of formula feeding in caesarean birth. Um, we have a lot of refined foods. We're really eating fermented foods, and often foods are grown with antibiotics. And obesity has been associated with a decrease in the level of diversity of gut bacteria. So the simple solution to restoring pathological disturbances in the composition of the gut microbiota may be a change in dietary habits but everyone today has such differing dietary habits. So this, um, so we've heard a little bit about these. Um, so these things can have an impact on the gut microbiota. And these include, include prebiotics, probiotics, antibiotics, and a faecal microbiota transplant. 
So a prebiotic is a type of fibre that promotes the good bacteria in the gut. So not all fibres are prebiotics. They need to be classified as a prebiotic being a fibre that must pass through the gastrointestinal tract undigested and stimulate the growth or activity of certain good bacteria in the large intestine and therefore confer a health benefit to the host. So basically prebiotics act as a fertiliser for our resident um, gut bacteria. So probiotics, on the other hand, are defined as live microorganisms that, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit for the host. So a probiotic is adding microorganisms to those already colonised in the gut. There are already many um, probiotic products available on the market, and many strains in the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium genre are considered to be probiotic. But it is important to note that you need to keep consuming probiotics as the bacteria don't colonise in your gut, but as with diet, you can cause a change, so an increase or a decrease in your resident bacteria or those that have already colonised. So antibiotics. So these kill bacteria. They can help kill pathogens, but they'll also affect the good bacteria in the gut. So antibiotics can alter your gut microflora significantly. The microbial populations can become less diverse and the abilities of the bacteria can change. So such alterations in the normal gut flora may then result in alterations in the person's metabolic pathways. The use of antibiotics that disturb the gastrointestinal flora are also associated with clinical symptoms such as diarrhoea. Gut bacteria can also um, become resistant to antibiotics, and research has shown steadily rising rates of antimicrobial resistance in a range of common bacterial pathogens, and this is a major threat to human health. So as you can imagine, there are huge differences in antibiotic use between countries. So for example, there is a much higher use of antibiotics in China compared to the US. So a faecal microbiota transplant is a promising treatment for recurrent C. difficile infection and the pre procedure has already been carried out in New Zealand. So basically they can collect a stool from what they consider to be a healthy individual and administer it directly into the colon of a sick person. So in theory they're replacing a bad microbiota with a healthy microbiota. So in summary, from my research, we're expecting to see differences in the gut microbiota between individuals with different glucose tolerance. This would suggest that the differences in glucose tolerance might be caused by the differences in gut bacteria through various proposed mechanisms. For example, an increased energy harvest leading to weight gain and insulin resistance, or an increased gut permeability leading to inflammation and impaired insulin and glucose tolerance. So secondly, we'll investigate if we can explain the differences in gut bacteria that have contributed to the difference in glucose tolerance by diet. So for example, you might expect normal glucose tolerance to be associated with an increase in fruit and vegetable intake. The next question is, how can we change the gut in order to change the gut bacteria to improve metabolic health? such as glucose tolerance. So I don't want to preface anything that Paul might say, but he's done a lot of work in this area. But as you might know, there's some research on kiwifruit that suggests that can change the gut microbiota. So kiwifruit contains polyphenolics and non-digestible carbohydrates, such as pectic hemicellulose and cellulosic polysaccharides, which can be degraded by bacteria in the colon, which results in beneficial effects. So could gold kiwi fruit contribute to the golden poo? Thank you. 